Okay, roll casting. You all know what it is. In a roll cast, we've got a casting arc just like we have in an overhead cast. You know, so our casting arc is going to be like this. But with roll casts, they're relatively short, typically, and we want the loop to stay real low. So I'm going to take that casting arc and I'm going to tip it forward. Well, to tip it forward means that my starting point in the back has got to be pretty vertical, and my stop on the other end is going to be about at this, this position. But I need to have a, as much line behind me, as much line in this D loop as I can get, because this is the only line I can apply power to. All the rest of this line is kind of a hindrance to the system, so I'm going to have to apply all the power of the cast to the line that's hanging from the rod tip to the ground. And that's got to drive all the rest of this, so the roll cast is a pretty powerful cast. So I get all this line back here, and I do it by making my D-loop, by bringing the rod way back. Then I'm going to bring the rod tip up, because if I make the cast from here, well, I'll show you in a minute. So now I bring the rod up to the position where I want to start my stroke so I get the loop I want. Now I'm going to drive it hard forward and down, stop the rod at about this position, and if I've done it right, this line should roll out across the grass, and the top leg of the loop should be about head high. That was a little too low. That was about right. Now you can see that if there wasn't an anchor on the, you can see that that would go all the way out and straighten out nicely. It's got nice power, it's nice and low, it's not wind resistant. So again, make your D-loop up to the start position, power it hard forward and down to about there, and then analyze the loop by looking at the top leg. If it's real high, then you've applied the power too soon. The biggest error, the biggest flaw that we see both in students and in people taking this test is that when they explain, and I always ask on the test, I say, I want you to go through the process of making a roll cast in slow motion. I want you to show me every step of the way. I want you to talk it through and demonstrate it in slow motion. And it would look just, and this is what we usually get. Okay, I'm going to make my D-loop, I draw it back real slow and easy like this, and then I'm just going to jab around about something that doesn't mean anything there for a second. The rod miraculously is going to end up here. I've said nothing about it, but it's, it's here, which is good, and then make the cast and everything's lovely. But here's what happens if you have a student and you don't clarify that little bit in the middle, of that mysterious part. They'll come back to here, they'll make their D-loop, and they're going to make the cast right from here. If I make this cast right from here, what direction is the rod tip going to go initially? it's going to go up. Watch where the top leg of the loop goes. And you can see where that was going to end up. So, this, the process for making a roll cast. Draw the line back slowly. You need to leave it on the water. If you don't, it all flips back here behind you and you end up with something else or a big mess. Make your D-loop. Then, slowly bring the rod up to the position, the start position, which is going to be almost vertical. It's like 12, 30, 1 o'clock. Then power it hard forward and down to about here, and stop. Now the critical thing is the angle of the rod. That's the most critical thing. If it's here, the rod, direct, the rod tip direction when you start applying power is up and it throws the line way high. So that's, that's the roll cast. We're also going to ask for it off shoulder, same thing. Oop, caught on our dandelion. And um, then we ask for a big loop roll cast. And when you do that, the setup's all the same. You drag it back, you make your nice D-loop, you leave the rod right there. And the reason we asked for this task is we want to make sure you can demonstrate it to a student. Leave it right there, make the cast. It goes way high and always lands in a pile. And then the last thing we ask for in a roll cast is accuracy, which is really tough to do on grass. When we do the accuracy task, we are not very concerned that you hit the targets. This is not a contest, it's not competitive accuracy casting. We want to see that you know the techniques to be accurate and that they look good and that they're sound and solid and that you can actually make this cast with technique and form that is nice. Now if you do all that you're likely to be very accurate so it's usually not an issue. I can't remember, I don't think I've ever failed anybody on this task if their form was good. I know I've never I've never failed anybody on this task where they threw nice loops and the trajectory was good, but then they missed the target. I've failed a lot of people on this task that hit the targets very nicely, but it looked like this. That was pretty close. So there are 
three targets, 20, 30, 45 feet. I've got one at 20 and one at about 30, and I'll have an imaginary one at 40. And what we'll do is we usually start with, you know, you holding the line in your hand, just because we don't want you to measure to the first target. Line. What we're looking for, high back cast, for the short one at least, and a low front cast, both top and bottom legs aimed at the target. If you see a lot of, of this, I can tell you right now that this is going to be not accurate on a you know, on a windy day. Watch how this fly floats in from way up high compared to this. I mean that fly, although fly doesn't land much harder, it doesn't float around. It doesn't have any time to get off track, off course. That loop should enter up, should open right above the target. The Top and bottom leg are aimed down. Kind of hovering loop he's doing. He's able to judge where the fly is relative to the target. Watch the Watch the fly just hover over the target right there. See it? That tells me pretty much where it's going to land. So I'm judging the distance by watching the fly hover over the target. I hesitate just a fraction of a second. I watch the fly kind of stop and hang there. See it? So he's aiming about two feet above it. And then the, the longer one trajectory will be flatter. So, but that's what we're looking for. Then we go off shoulder. One of the couple of tasks that people probably have to work the hardest to get under. Yeah, this one takes some practice. It's off shoulder, and of course if the wind is on the wrong side, then you want to get the line and everything on the other side for safety reasons primarily. Um, then you got to go off shoulder. And there's a couple of different ways to cast off shoulder. I think the easiest way is to leave your hand on the same side, just angle the rod across your head so that puts the rod tip on the downwind side. The other way to do it is move your whole hand across and cast this way. Some people prefer this, a lot of people prefer this. I think this way is easier, this is your choice, we don't care. Um, it'd be, and just watch my hand for a minute. Here's, here's this side. The elbow came up and the hand just... Elbow has to come up or you yeah. whack yourself in the head. So just raise everything up a little bit, tip the, hand, tip the rod over. The first task is um, just to show us that you know how to double haul. You can throw a really nice clean loop, so the nice perfect technique double haul. And so we're not looking for a lot of line speed, we're looking for really nice loops. Actually throwing a little harder than normal because I've got to throw my back cast into a, a breeze. So I'm picking up the pace a little more than I would on that normally. Just look at the haul for a minute. Notice my haul ends up with a straight elbow on both ends. I'm not hauling real hard and fast. But a lot of times we'll see a back haul that's just a short little jerk on the line and it throws a tailing loop and the front is usually a little longer and smoother. They, we really want to see them about the same. The rod stroke front and back is the same. The haul should be the same. If your haul is different front to back, you're going to have to make some adjustment with the rod to compensate for the fact the haul is different. You add more power with this, you can back off with this, you have less power. It just makes it a lot harder. So try to work on making this all as consistent as, consistent as you can. If you look at it, the arm motions, the two arm motions are almost identical. Here's my rod hand, and here's my rod stroke. Elbow, wrist. You start with the big muscle of the shoulder, you make some motion there, then the elbow moves a bit, and then you typically end with the wrist. If you're going to do a full arm cast, which you do with distance. Look at my haul. See my arm? Here's where I'm starting both. Shoulders. Elbow. Same time, same motion. The little power finish on both is at the wrist right at the same time. If you do too much of either, you're going to get that dreaded tailing loop. Yep. Now we'll tighten them up. Tighten them. Tighter? <laughs> The easiest way to make it is to carry a fairly long line, learn how to learn how to carry like 55 feet, and then just, just let it go. Well, that was probably more like 80, but that's it. If you can do it easy like that, I mean, we'll, we'll probably ask to see it several times because it's so pretty and it's just pleasant to watch, but you will have passed the task on the first one. So often, so often we get this. Somebody is carrying not enough line. This is too short. And this is what we get.
Yeah, 65, 65 feet with wind. Yeah, did all of you notice how his back cast was going down and then you had this big, what do we call a square back loop or a box back loop? And that's because I'm coming back here, I'm just ripping it hard to the back and the last thing the rod tip does is dive down like that and that throws that, that kind of corner in the bottom of the loop. Very inefficient, very wind resistant. You got to get it straight. More and more important is if you get a long, relatively long line that's straight out behind you, and then you just use a long, smooth stroke and a little bit of haul and let go, there's your 75 feet every time. But the, the 75 footer, uh, a lot of people get all wound up about it. Um, you know, and if you can't do it, you should get a little excited, but it is not. In, in my experience, people have failed, the, I failed more people on this test for not being able to make the 75, or they make it barely, but it's really ugly and uh, not being able to throw tailing loops on command. A lot of people have worked so hard to cure that that they just have not been able to get themselves to make tailing loops anymore. So, on the, um, the one is uh, we talk about, we explain how to cast into a headwind. And it, it's, you can make this one really, really fast. There's three things you gotta do. You gotta throw a tight loop, you gotta aim it right, which means low, and you gotta throw it a little faster. And if you just come out and say, tight loop, aimed right, going faster, it's going to be a really short, really short task. And it just looks like this, and there it is. High back loop, low front loop, going a little faster than normal because of the wind. We happen to have a nice headwind, and there it is. If that same loop is just a little too high, So the trajectory is important. Sometimes people will say, throw a sidearm and keep everything under the wind. <laughs> yeah. But the, the problem with that is, and, and there's actually there's a scientific study on this, on wind speeds. If it's blowing 20 miles an hour, 20 feet above the ground, you know, the theory on throwing sidearm getting under the wind is that once you're down in here, the wind is much less. And so you're actually throwing below where the strong wind is. But the, the study that was done showed if it's blowing 20 at 20 feet, it's blowing 20 at 10 feet, it's blowing 20 at 6 feet, it's blowing 20 at 3 feet, it's blowing 20 at 2 feet, it's blowing 19 at 12 inches, it's blowing 18 at your ankles, and then it starts to make a difference. So if, if you want to make that work, your loops all have to be lower than that. So the key is getting the line to straighten with the fly really close to the water so it doesn't have very far to drop. And it's really, really tough to make that work. We look for real clean, concise explanations. Uh, and, and just a little bit on that. Um, don't use sports jargon. Don't use casting terms if you have clients or, or you know, students that don't know them. Uh, if somebody doesn't play golf or tennis, they may understand when you talk about breaking the wrist. We hear a lot of breaking the wrist, or people are wristy, or they're wristing. Make sure your people know what you know. Know what you mean when you say words. And I much prefer to say, you know, if somebody's casting like this, and we all might say, well, you're breaking your wrist. Well, that implies that you shouldn't break your wrist. Now, what is breaking your wrist anyway? Does that mean none at all? Does that mean no? You know, what does that really mean? Use words that really mean what you want to say. In this case, I would say you're bending your wrist way too much when you're casting. Now, who wouldn't understand what that means? Everybody gets it. So I would say, bend your wrist less. If they simply do that, you will get a significant improvement. A real common thing to do when you're learning all this stuff, you know, you've used the six step method, you figure it out and you go, you know, those were nice loops, but they're kind of wide. I want you to narrow your casting arc. And they look at you like, okay, Speaking sure. Speaking Greek. Yeah, and they'll say, okay, you, and then you've identified the concept you've even corrected the concept but you have to tell them what to do with their hand and the rod mm -hmm. so i would i would say okay i want you to do those okay i want you to stop on your forward cast okay say so see here we stopped here and the rod's here that was really nice but we can get a tighter loop if we end up stopping here okay so you were here yep now i want you to see here you see the position yep yep go ahead and try a couple with that and so you that's it that's, that's the test. But you need to get a copy of the test. It's on the website. Just print it off and just work through the tasks. And it's really good if you have somebody you can work with because you need to do the verbal, the instructional part too. And you can work back and forth. You've got some good mentors here that can help. And uh, 
but that's that's what it takes and the more help you get from somebody who's already done it who knows it the faster it will happen if you're already a good caster and uh, it's just a matter of getting the verbal part right and you know fine-tuning some of the casts you might not use a lot can happen pretty fast